Sean is also a close personal friend and I've watched him grow through good economies and bad economies. I've seen him grow through periods of stress and periods of great abundance. On today's episode of YouTube Insider, Sean Cannell and I go behind the scenes to share with young creators what it takes strategically to grow on YouTube in a professional way. If you're tired of just throwing videos up and hoping that something happens, you really need to watch this interview. There's two parts. In the first part, we talk about YouTube strategy. And in the second part, we're really diving into his YouTube channel and what strategies he's used on YouTube and off YouTube to grow his channel and become one of the number one names in the industry. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go to my interview with Sean Cannell. You know, you've been through a ton, right? A ton of growth. You, you've kind of got this uh, Think Media. You, you've had that channel and you've got Think Marketing now, yes. right? Like why didn't you just keep it all on one channel? Think Media is 10 years old now, mm -hmm. uh, 1 million subscribers. We just hit that, so wow. that's super encouraging. That's amazing. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of, you know, that's a great milestone. But another thing, and I heard you talking about this on your channel recently, I think one of the mistakes I made on the journey was our views do not reflect that subscriber number. Right. And, and no one's ever does. Nobody with a million subscribers gets a million views necessarily on every video. Right. But even percentagely, there can be like kind of a health meter there. And we're a little bit low. And part of that, I think, is the age. Yeah. That you can't really control. If you've yeah. been around a long time, you can accumulate subscribers over more time. But then two is the maybe inconsistency of content. I mean, you mentioned you've set your great whatever Snapchat series, your great this series. Yeah. And when someone comes and subscribes for a particular reason, then they may not like the other content you have. Think Media has suffered from this at, at a pretty maybe kind of high level yeah. where I've, you know, it's kind of covering tech and then also covering tutorials, but then it started weaving in the YouTube tips and then even would start getting maybe more obscure on online business and then maybe even talk about productivity. And that can be okay. And again, you even still have an impact in that. Right. But that uh, the focus of the channel, um, I think, suffered. And they started to really get clear on topics that perform well and the reason the bulk of the subscribers that grew on Think Media were for best camera for YouTube uh -huh. and how to use a camera for YouTube. Yeah. And so especially in 2020 and beyond, we're learning that single value proposition YouTube channels do better than ever before and you never yeah. want to upload a video that your subscribers didn't subscribe That's for. big. That's one that I've really been gravitating towards. And so I think that we wanted to do a couple things. One, we wanted to start a video podcast yeah. in particular. Yeah. I believe that that is a major trend people should be paying attention to. Joe Rogan as a model, H3H3, Logan Paul, Jay Shetty, uh, a lot of people Tom doing, Bilyeu, doing, vid right. Tom Bilyeu, doing video podcasts, Grant Cardone, video podcasts. Um, and so we definitely wanted to do that, but then also thought about shifting the business com content over yeah. and actually doubling down on Think Media. So the new vision for Think Media is to essentially be the YouTube channel CNET for content creators. Okay. What do you say to the content creator who is right now sort of in that phase where he's covering apples, oranges, and bananas? Can that creator still pick a focus? I, I think there was times when I was blind to what was happening, and then there was even times when I was aware of what was happening, but I didn't necessarily change, because I think that sometimes um, it takes time to implement the next thing. Yeah, and as entrepreneurs, sure. you just stay consistent. And you might even, you know, you're operating, you're like, things are working. I'm not super pumped about everything, but I'm working what's working yeah. and I'm getting ready for the next season. So I think that if, yeah, if you're covering apples, oranges, and whatever, I mean, you still might be getting results. Like if things are working, I would really believe that small tweaks lead to giant peaks. Right. Sometimes you need to make a major move, but I think it's also steering and shifting your audience. I mean, there's also been some major moves on Think Media, adding other content creators. Right. Um, shifting it back to being more focused tech. And honestly, some of this, not even that I ever intend to sell Think Media, but there's a book called Built to Sell. Yeah. And there's a question between building a personal brand versus building like a business brand um, or a, a brand like CNET or like, um, what's another example of, of something? SNL is one we're talking about. Yeah. That Saturday Night Live is a brand that delivers comedy, but they've had a cast that has cycled through. Right. Um, and so we've been talking about, I think I was like, well, think media has to be Sean Cannell. Well, it's probably still is. We're years away from probably shifting it right. in a major way. But, but I was like, SNL's done it and they're still around today. Yeah. But there's different characters yeah. on it. 
So anyways, I think there's, there's family, legacy, scalability, a lot of those things come into that. And then think marketing is the same. I've got a personal channel, Sean Ken, I don't upload there. I actually think that maybe five years from now, I'll do something with my personal brand in right. a different way. But I, you know, and this was like the learnings and the journey. I wasn't thinking this way 10 years ago. Yeah, of course. Architecting this stuff. Right. It's been like real time moves, looking at the- You kind of architect resources. as you go, right? Yeah, like it's like Lego building. It's like, oh, I, I got myself into this corner now. I got to yeah. kind of correct and- That's right. And move on from there. So to the apples oranges character, I think, no, I wouldn't stress out about it. I would say in light of that maybe aha moment, think about where you're steering towards, where you're pivoting towards. I, again, sometimes I think it could be unwise and maybe even careless to make major moves in your business because it might kill the current revenue or momentum. Yeah, yeah. But steer towards, you should always be making those navigational adjustments so that you make it, you're, you're navigating towards that end destination that you want for your business, your company, your team, whatever it is. What do you see as the biggest, the deadliest, like if you do this thing, you are going to fail. It's not going to work out. What's the most common mistake that you see between creators that, that, that fail? And I think it's a mistake of uh, under investment. I think that a lot of entrepreneurs are tempted to look for magic pills. On the one hand, I don't blame them. I don't even know if it's like a bad motivation. They're just so busy. There's so much on their plate. Right. And so they have almost no bandwidth. And so what they're looking for is like a five minute fix. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the biggest mistake because it's, it's not understanding what YouTube is and it's the wrong approach. YouTube is a long game. YouTube is a play that you make. I believe it's irresponsible for any entrepreneur not to invest in YouTube. But what you're investing in, I believe, is legacy. You're mm -hmm. investing in building a body of work, a library of videos, a pillar of influence that is going to build your brand, your revenue, your profits, your personal brand, your reputation over decades. Yeah. And so um, if you want almost a direct response result in your business, then you should do direct response marketing. Yeah, hallelujah. Yeah, do that, run ads. Yeah, right? run ads and it's money in, money out. So I think that's the mistake is thinking that it's, it, and then it's not devoting resources. I found that even if you support uh, a business owner with uh, the right tools, even the right team, if they're not bought in and sold on it, on actually committing to YouTube. It doesn't have to be at a major level, but you gotta be thoughtful, you gotta be there. I think about Omar, we were just talking to yeah. on the Think Media team. He works with Liv Bay Lash in Las Vegas, and he's doing a lot of the heavy lifting for them, helping with the video podcast, helping them produce a search-based video a week, two videos a week. Wow. They have an eight-figure um, company, uh, physical lash stores, lash artists working there, selling lashes and glue online, yeah, and doing cool. like masterminds. So they, they built this awesome company, but they're bought into the fact that they get their video ideas ready. Yeah. They will sit down and batch shoot the videos. Yeah. They will shoot the tutorials and they'll listen and do what he tells them to do. They got a business to run, but they're not. Some people want to say, hey, just repurpose my content. Yeah, you yeah. Know, like take what I'm already doing yeah, just, and, you know, and schlep it up there. Yeah, right. and, and that's what I see that doesn't work. They're not, they're not at least giving enough energy and attention to do what's necessary to win on YouTube. And I think it's, and I, I'm fair, because they also say, well, I'm not gonna do it until I see the results. Yeah. Well, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah. And I think you have to believe and see that if you look in the entrepreneur kind of personal development space, and a Gary Vaynerchuk, Brennan Burchard, Marie Forleo, Grant Cardone, these, these YouTube channels yeah. are massive pillars of influence. Yeah. And so you go, why are they investing in those? Well, they have invested in it at a level where they take YouTube serious. They put dollars there. They put right. their money where the mouth is, you right. know, like, uh, and. Uh, it's not a schlep up scenario. It's not a like, hey, let's see what we can that's right. make happen without, without with like minimal effort, you, you know, take, take some of my old home videos and yeah. put them up there. Yeah. Um, so on that same accord, uh, what is the big success metric? What's the big thing where if, if YouTubers and, and uh, business owners and, and thought leaders were to do this, success would come in time. Like no matter what, like what is the big thing you're saying that, that's just absent from these campaigns? The big step in YouTube is to make videos that people actually wanna watch. Oh, that's big. And, and what I mean by that in, in our thesis is research before you press record. Okay. You know, we're huge on ranking and I believe that ranking means two things in 2020 and beyond. It means ranking your videos in search, but a ranked video on YouTube, in my opinion, is just a video that is showing up ranked in YouTube. It's showing up on the homepage, it's showing up in suggested, or it's showing up in search. 
to me, that's a video that the algorithm has taken and is now putting in front of people okay. that are looking for something. Yeah. Because either they're looking for it directly by typing in a question to the search bar, or they're actually looking for it with their intent. Yeah. Google that's is even studying that user's intent and seeing this person is looking for this kind of information and a YouTube account and a uh, Google account that are connected. You can do like intent-based Google YouTube ads. Right. So it might actually start on YouTube and then the ad starts being suggested. Right. Yeah, because, right. and, and what they've understood is that this viewer is looking for a dentist or this viewer is looking for entertainment of right. some kind or this viewer. So the point is, I think, is to reverse engineer what your target audience, so you gotta be clear on your who and your what, who are you trying to reach and what problem do you solve for them? Mm -hmm. And you gotta be clear on what kind of videos would they want to actually watch. Then your next goal is to make at least one video a week for the rest of time. Right, you know, and that's it, isn't yeah. it? Like there's, we often kind of approach this with like, oh, I'll, I'll make one video a week for a month, and sure. if it doesn't work, then I'm out. Uh, but nothing works that way, it's, right? It's the people, and, and those that commit to that process is stunning. I was just talking to uh, Cassandra from our Inner Circle program. Three years on YouTube, she's got one video coming up on a million views. She's the LinkedIn. Yeah, uh, she does a yeah. lot of LinkedIn she's and great. coaching Cassandra's stuff. Great. Yeah, yeah. And, and she was just talking about like, I had to go through a year where I was getting six views, yeah. five views, yeah. four it's views, hard. but she's about to quit her job and go all in and really have her whole life changed. Right. And have this life on her own terms and this right. whole you know, dream where she can be building her business and her consulting and her coaching. Um, all because she realized that YouTube was a marathon and not a sprint and yeah. she committed to that process. Um, YouTube's like a fine wine. It gets better with age. That's so true. When do you know uh, when your audience is, is too broad versus too small, like that Goldilocks zone? So for example, you know, the real estate agent in Atlanta, Georgia is often, I'm gonna start a YouTube channel for people in Atlanta, Georgia, yeah. right? But you're not gonna build a channel that way, or are you? I say wide channel niche videos. Okay. So I think what can happen, one of our clients did this. Her expertise was specifically helping yoga instructors throw yoga retreats. Oh, duh. I mean. So, and she's great at it. She can fill out coaching or masterminds to help, and she's got a great business, and clients love her work. But the mistake she made was she branded her channel about how to help people do yoga retreats. Okay. So I'm saying wide channel niche videos, meaning I actually think her channel could be as wide as the go-to channel for all things a yoga instructor would ever need to know. Yeah. But not, but not a yogi, not, not, a, not a person not a who wants, yes. Yeah, because that's two different things. The yogi wants to actually watch the tutorials right, and right, follow right. along, whereas she could talk about, so it's all things the business side yeah. of, it could be opening up a shop, it could be what to charge, it could be taxes, right. it could be the lifestyle of being an instructor, it could, it could be a vlog of, of people getting to see uh, how she's built her business and getting to know more about her. That because the wide channel, it fits under that. It's just a, a resource of encouragement, education, knowledge for yoga instructors. For yoga instructors. And there is a big enough audience, you believe. Oh, for sure. Okay, so, so when you're, you're looking for your customer, your, your channel should have videos for the customer, right? But you never go outside of that. And yeah, I think, uh, uh, talking to my friend Rory Vaden, um, he said, he talked about it as lenses. You have this lenses that is kind of like That's cool. the, the, the how you help people, uh, and that might be the problem that you solve for people, which his was obscurity. I help people get discovered yeah. if they're obscure. But then also how you do it, because this, and this is also what makes you unique because I was like, I help people get out of obscurity as well too, but he doesn't teach video. Right. And so, so it's like, I help people get discovered, but my modality is video. Somebody else might be like, it's, I'm really good at helping them optimize their web page to right, be discovered. Right. Or podcasting, maybe. And so right. it could be these two different lenses. And then he said, everything you do, it doesn't have to only be about that, yeah. but it has to be filtered through these lenses. Yeah, that's good. And that's what I would agree with too. So she might say, hey, you know, on this channel, we help yoga instructors build their businesses. But today, I just wanted to show you a little bit inside of my personal life. Right. I think that you've just teed up the content through that lens, but yet you're still maybe being relational and taking somebody behind, uh, you know, maybe show them a little bit of lifestyle and then maybe you show them how you personally do yoga in your hotel room in a few clips. So I think that then you need to have freedom to play within your sandbox, if you will, sure. 
but those lenses give you that clear sandbox. Right. Why, why are you, you, you never want to upload a video that your subscribers didn't subscribe for. It doesn't mean that you never break the rules. You just right. need to know what the rules are. Right. Because you got to test new concepts. Yeah. But I think that, that, that help, that's what makes channels work is at least being really clear on honoring the audience for why they're there. You may lob out another video, but tie it back. Tie it into, right. a, like, why is it here? Why are you showing me this? And then I think the other thing about that is though also that the more influence you build on YouTube, it's like creating a Death Star, right? Star Wars. Yeah. And so the more influence you build on YouTube now, wherever you can send that powerful laser, you could potentially shift audiences other places. So at one point someone asked me, Sean, why don't you vlog? It'd be cool to see a vlog of your life on YouTube. Yeah. Why, don't, why, don't, why, why aren't you vlogging? And I said, I, I am. It's called Instagram Stories. Yeah, there you go. Like, what do you mean? I am. And, and, and people don't think about it that way. But then I thought I actually should do a better job of my YouTube videos, letting people know, Hey, by the way, if yeah. you want to connect in another dimension, but yeah. a single value proposition, YouTube channel, that's the thing. Grow that huge, be, be the go-to source right. for yoga instructors for that thing. And then potentially use the influence there to maybe it, you could maybe tie in some food and nutrition and some sure. stuff to that because sure. that's part of that yoga lifestyle. But then again, you maybe then start a recipe channel because that's the next thing you want to build. Yeah. Leverage that influence and guess what? That channel is going to have more influence the more focused you stay. What type of content should we be producing? What is working? Um, what would you advise someone to do? If I actually had to pick one, not that I need to, is I would start a video podcast. Period. Oh, okay. So right now you're like really sold on I'm video. so sold up because uh, for a couple reasons. I mean, so it's what we just did. So yeah. we're, you know, kind of taking uh, drinking our own medicine here. But I think that, and that doesn't have to be, most people, uh, people think podcasts are interview based. Uh, one of my favorite podcasts is called the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. Um, a great leadership kind of training from a guy who's, who's built multi-site churches, but is also just kind of a business podcast yeah. that anybody can listen to. Yeah. He does it solo rounds. But he turns a camera on, sits in front of a good USB mic, has his iPad out, really good content uh, that's around 22 to 25 minutes. Structured. Structured. Yeah. Delivers value. And I would think that his consumption of that content is stronger on the audio platforms. Yeah. Yeah. But he's so smart because of using YouTube. You have the search, you have yeah. the subscribe, you have the YouTube red users like me that want to consume it there anyways and just put their phone Same shut down and listen to it. Same still. way, yeah, because I can still listen to it, yeah. And so then on the flip side, again, Joe Rogan's a great example. Yeah. You go long form and that's guest based or multi-guest, H3H3 is doing the same thing. Yeah. Again, Jay Shetty, uh, sometimes solo rounds or sometimes, but the reason I say that is because now you, you have something consistent to put on YouTube. Uh, once a week, the Think Marketing Podcast comes out on Tuesdays uh, on YouTube, but then you're also maximizing across platform. I'm specifically thinking for entrepreneurs and business owners, right. if you want the one thing to maximize your time, that's the one show a week I would want coming out. And I think it's a modality that for anybody that's maybe selling information or even if they're selling actual business services. Like service. But, yeah, but they want to have like that inroad of helping yeah. people solve problems. Yeah. It's just a modality where what's exactly what Live Bay Lash is doing. Their, their target audience, like yoga instructors, is Lash artists. How do you uh, keep your money flowing in during slow seasons? How do you get better clientele? How do you, it's everything about the lash business. Right. And, and they, it's a very small niche, yeah. but they are like the kings of this small niche. Right, right, they own it. And that video, so, and there's, and not only that, they can go through like 52 episodes. They had some trouble with their name where they had to change their name. So it kind of made some of their old content. They had to take it down because they had that old branding. Sure. And um, with that though, they started remaking topics and redoing some of the old topics with like maybe some of the same tips or if not the same tips yep. that had been about a year ago, guess how many people were like complaining in the comments? Probably zero. Zero. Right, yeah. So even from a standpoint of like, well, what if I run out of stuff? Well, like- Do it again. Do it again. Right, yeah, yeah. you just keep, do it from another angle. You're better this year than you were last year. That's right. Now, you have the three tips last year, but two more you've learned since yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. And just, and so, Again, there's a lot of things you could do, but I think that's also sustainable because it, yes, it could be kind of talking head like this in a way, but it's sit down, whether an interview, yeah. whether solo, by the way, whether Zoom, Skype, uh, you can get it on video and be on YouTube, but then you're also maximizing your time across social media. And this is not a new concept. Uh, Gary Vee's talked a lot about this. And like multi-purposing. It, but, th but it's become so uh, re repurposable. So here's the model. We 
we want to hit 27 minutes in our time because yeah. that's the average commute in America. Yeah. And even if we do like an hour long conversation, maybe two, turn it into two parts. So yeah. someone could like listen on the way of work and have a stopping point on the way home, binge a couple episodes, maybe even release two in a row. My friend Shalene Johnson will do that. That works for me At every least time. least break it up. Yeah. And, um, and, but then out of that, because you have the video, now you have IGTV, right. Instagram feed, clip for LinkedIn. Uh, it sounds like you're saying get started with content and let the theme, let the, the, the structure of the format sort of appear, but just get started with something. Absolutely. And that's also, you know, we launched our podcast. We're only like 10 episodes in. Right. I'm not super happy with them. Yeah, we you kinda, mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, we got our first 10 going, but like done is better than perfect. And you can, you can launch and then you get feedback so you can adjust. Right. You can now, now you've got a few listeners and say, what do you want to hear about next? And so we've been throwing some stuff out there, like on the YouTube community tab, shoot us some topics. Y you, again, you're not going to get data until you actually put the product yeah. to, in the market. Yeah. And so, yeah, absolutely launch. And then that's where the action happens. So at the end of the day, we want to serve our community, answer their questions, answer their uh, pain points. Um, but if you don't, if you're not making any motion yet, you have nothing to adjust I and nothing to tweak. I, your analytic process, right? What are the big two or three analytics that you are looking at for every video, every time, and how does that affect your content production? So I want to encourage people. This is an intimidating area. You know, it's like, okay, data. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't do well in school. Right, I did numbers, it. You know, I'm not good right. at math or whatever. Um, but the the cool thing is, on a surface level, YouTube Studio has really made some major moves um, and specifically they summarize really good information for you now. Yeah, they yeah. give you a couple sentences where they'll say this video is perf performing worse than usual because your subscribers are just not as interested. Yeah. And for all of us YouTube experts that talk about all the ninja stuff, like that pretty much sums it up. Yeah, that's it's it, like, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. You're like, okay, so, so then you just ask yourself, you're like, well, that makes sense. This topic was a little it's kind of a stretch. I, I, I lost my core audience. Right. I mean, if you're talking about to that, the reason they subscribed and you continue, continue to add value to that core promise, they're probably gonna keep watching it. Right. But it, I've noticed, and, and I was just talking to our friend Tim Schmoyer about this too, like, um, when you do this long enough, you almost feel it. You're like, I know this video is probably going to do pretty good, and this one probably won't. Yeah, you know, you yeah. kind of because you've studied. So level one is is right on the homepage inside of your YouTube Studio. It evaluates your top ten videos yeah. against your last top ten. Mind you, this is also why you got to punch fear and perfectionism in the face and just start and post pretty much 20 to 30 videos before you even really worry about this too Right, much. yeah, get stuff up and then let them we, saturate. We right? barely have, an, we don't even have the full list in Think Marketing. Like it's like there's eight and then our unlisted videos. So I'm like, we don't even, there isn't a top 10 to compare with our right, new channel. Right. So you gotta post a little while. So that'd be the first thing you look at that and then look at what it's telling you. Now they do at the end of the month, they do a summary. There's a really cool like month summary that YouTube breaks it down. It says, these are the videos that did the best. These are the ones that didn't do as good. Here are some of the trends we've noticed. And this is YouTube's attempt to empower the creator to just get better results because they really do want to see you win. Yeah. They want to sell advertising, but they need to sell advertising on video content that's getting viewed. So they, they want to see you win. Um, more specifically though, uh, I, the main two metrics is click-through rate and average view duration. Um, if you basically can, through your title and your thumbnail and your topic, yeah get someone to actually click on the video, and then you can get the average people watching the video to watch at least 60%, it's pretty much game over. If you've got an average view duration, and Cass, who we were just talking to, her two biggest videos have average view durations of 70 to 80%. Yeah. And the ones that are being suggested and getting views, and I was like, seems crazy, but that's, that's a point where, again, if the video is 10 minutes long, that means the average viewer is watching at least six, seven, or eight minutes. That's big. So that's, it's hard to do, too. It's it no is. easy feat. But if, if you can hit that average view duration and a good click-through rate or both. Do you put any type of psychology into the video to get them to watch longer? It's things like open loops, yep. things like story. Yes. Talk to us a little bit about how you use those things. A couple practical things would be opening up with what the video is about, but I think the key is what result and why it matters. So for example, if we teach YouTube tips, we might say in this video, we're gonna teach you uh, three tips on understanding YouTube analytics. Yeah. Decent, 
but that's a disconnect from the why. Most viewers are not waking up saying, you know, I just feel, if I understood analytics better, I'd be a happier person. Right, they don't even know. Yeah, and it's really that analytics, understanding analytics better could lead to getting more views, more subscribers, or maybe making more money. That's the actual desire. So you need to make sure you're hitting the core desire of your audience plus what they're about to learn. So that becomes twice as strong. So it almost, if you were like doing like dating and relationships, you might say something like three ways to approach a woman to ask her on a date, pretty strong. But you also might say, uh, you know, in this video, I'm going to share three different ways that you could approach a woman to ask her on a date that is guaranteed to get you a phone number and to make a strong connection right. with, so it's, it's what they're actually desiring. And then the third layer you could layer that on and also make sure you watch until the end of the video because in it, I'm going to share this one opening line that literally got a girl to cry and instantly marry me. You know what I right, mean? Right, yeah. yeah. This bonus tip, stay to the end. And you stay are, are you putting end. that actually into the hook, are you suggesting, or is this an example? If it could be early on, great. But yeah. you really... Because you want to let them know ahead of time. Like, there's, it's, this is worth watching. Absolutely. You know, there's a, an unfolding that's going to happen. And you don't video. want it to be gimmicky. Right. Uh, but I think that's the key of knowing that you've actually packed the video with different value. And part of it's even just educating the audience. Because one of the problems with, like, I'm going to share three tips with you, is as soon as you hit tip three, you haven't even pre-educated that there's going to be something coming after right. it. So a lot of people will bail at tip three. So that's, a, that's like the first thing in the opening. I think next would be a pattern interrupts. Yeah. When you're droning on about information and whatever, a pattern interrupt could be um, something that maybe is a little humor reset. Sure. Um, it also, uh, it, it, could be, it could be a lot of things, but you're just thinking about, here's your goal, is to reset attention. Yeah. Sometimes resetting attention can backfire too because you just woke up the viewer. You reminded they, they, them. You reminded them yeah. that they want to skip the video. Yeah, yeah. But nevertheless, that's your goal is to, is to kind of just trigger because sometimes, and I'll fall into this, I'm talking about tech and it's like blah, 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 blah. So how do you just re-engage, do something funny? This was an organic one that happened, but Nolan was shooting a video and a, squ a squirrel came up to uh, kind of like pull the tripod bag away. It really? was like super funny. That no was happening kidding. in a park. But I mean, people were talking about it in the comments and when you looked at the watch time, all this engagement happened around there. So it's a good example of seeing whether it's maybe humor or, and then it also could sort of like a pattern interrupt be this change of scene. There's no question that edited videos can hold retention a lot better than a non-edited. I, I would agree 100%. And being a live person, you know, we focus a lot on how do we re-engage, how do we change the scene yeah. while still going live. And I think that's part of the art that we're developing and, and sort of bringing to, bringing to YouTube. Hey, I'm so glad that you've stuck around for the first half of the Sean Cannell interview. And I want you to know that what's coming up in the second part has more to do with Sean's personal growth and how he's managed to maintain his sanity and his family life while he's growing a world famous YouTube channel. And so if you're serious about growing a channel and you wanna know what it's like dealing with fame and dealing with massive popularity, then stick around for this next interview. But first, let me know what has been your biggest takeaway so far. Jot it down in the comment section. I'd love to hear from you and I'll be sure to respond. For now, let's finish our interview with Sean Cannell. YouTube famous is maybe media attention. Yeah, okay. Like, I, maybe the biggest YouTuber is what? A C-list celebrity? You think so? I would say A-list celebrity in some cases. Like, I would say the Paul brothers are right up there with, with anybody in Hollywood. No, I disagree with you. Really? I don't think that Paul brothers are up there with The Rock. No, but di okay, so if the different Rock audience. Okay, so A-list, yeah, well, maybe in size and reach, I was thinking about like the, actually, the demographic, like the people that like Dwayne Johnson, that's gonna be people like us, like our age group, whereas sure. the Paul's gonna be a skew lower, uh, a younger age. And, and you know what, I'm actually probably not even speaking to the amount of reach, because if you measure reach, there might even be greater reach on some YouTubers, yeah. but I'm also, I'm thinking almost about being like recognized in public. That's like kind of where like I go. Kevin Hart. Yeah, yeah. Like, but anyways, so I think about- uh, But do you get recognized in public? Yes, sometimes. Yeah. And uh, I guess, but I would say that I will, I can walk through a lot of airports yeah. with my Think Media jacket and nobody will say anything. Yeah. So the reason I think I'm more like micro is I can walk through our type of events 
and oh my gosh. Yeah. But you're in a niche chasm. Right. Of so course. I feel like that crossover famous is when mainstream. It's very, yeah, it's like yeah. mainstream. Yeah, it's like for sure. it's very difficult to go to the grocery store anymore. Right? Yeah. And you know, I think that there's there's a lot of value to that. Um, there was a period where I was getting stopped. I was doing a lot of news stuff on the local news, right? Sure. Um, so I was getting stopped at the Starbucks. That's that's a great example. I think about like a famous that like they might in a community. You yeah. can't walk around local. Seattle without knowing Dan Rather. Like, right. You're yeah. that guy. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Um, how, how do you feel that success um, has affected you from a creative standpoint? That's an interesting question. I, I, I don't know if you asked it this way, but I think success is like money. Success doesn't change you. It just amplifies who you already mm-hmm. are. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not, for the lack of sounding, however, just being as transparent as possible, hitting a million was um, exciting. I'm very honored. I'm very humbled and grateful. Uh, you're emotional too. You're emotional. And I, like, and I was pumped. I triggered was, me. Yeah. I was just like, I love to see that humility that it wasn't like, oh, I'm the man. It was, yeah. There was a, like a moment of like, let me gather myself. Yeah. It was a real honor. It was a very special moment yeah. where at the same time, um, and probably actually personally, a, a challenge that I have as an entrepreneur is maybe celebrating, is stopping to like absorb and celebrate and whatever. But I think the biggest thing that happened was it's like I hit a million and I was like, I celebrated a little bit and I was like, but it's back to work. What's next? It, yeah. but, it, but even more than like not dissatisfied, it was just like, I'm actually in this for the process, not for the pillar of You know, success. that's really interesting. Roberto said the same thing. We interviewed with him and, and he was all about process. Yeah. And he also said that he doesn't take time to enjoy the wins, yeah. you know? And it sounds like and you I, might take I a wanna, little bit more time. I wanna take more, I think I should, cause I think it's healthy. I think so And too. you put a lot of work into yeah. it. Uh, but at the same time, I think it was like, um, you know, it's, it's, it is really, it, I am mission driven. It's about the mission. It's about the, it is about the process, it's about tomorrow. It's about reaching and impacting more people. And so celebrating very healthy, the, the milestones, but then the work itself is something I truly enjoy yeah. and something that I care about. And so, uh, and I find joy in the work itself. So even just getting back to work the next day, it's like, yeah, it's the next video. It's the do you, next do you feel like, um, do you feel like with getting, like if you celebrate too much that you're going to fall behind? Yeah, there's probably a little bit of paranoia there yeah. of, of just saying that uh, you don't want to get comfortable or yeah. complacent. The five temptations of a CEO, uh, the first one in the book by Patrick Lencioni is getting more into preserving your leadership role and just being the man yeah. and just like protecting your salary and keeping the corner office than about results. Right. So, and, and I think, and I think that's actually probably a solid thing for me. That's even thinking, well, what's a million if I, if my YouTube knowledge isn't current, if right. I'm claiming to be right. uh, a YouTube teacher, I better still be learning. I, st- I still better be in the trenches. So I want to live in the trenches of that because plenty of people have hit a milestone and then got on to teach about it 20 years later of the thing that they did 20 years ago. That's, that's actually probably the Without end. staying relevant, without staying current is what yeah. you mean, yeah. Sure, and I mean not to, I'm obviously not casting shade on any individual, but it's kind of that classic thing of like a university entrepreneur professor right. who's never been an entrepreneur. Right. And so that's like the antithesis of who I am. Right. I'm like, I wanna stay, like I, I care about my craft. I want to actually be a master of my craft. I want to be the best competing against myself that I could possibly be. I want my information to be legit. I want to have real credibility and results on its own merits, right. not on just fame or glamour or numbers. And I mean, that may be, that's kind of the culture we're living in. If people want to pay for having check marks on their website or pay right. for followers right. or pay for the appearance of fame, I think that, I, I think the byproduct of excellence will be accolades. Um, but I, and, and so it's a weird balance. I probably go to the far extreme here. Yeah, yeah. I think it would be healthy to kind of embrace them more, but I'm almost like, let the accolades come, allow me to just keep putting out prolific work. Because I actually really believe, to me, I, I've fallen in love with the process of YouTube creation, and I believe that every video is part of my body of work, yes. my legacy, my right. portfolio. Yes. You know, and yeah. so that's what I love to put out. Uh, I woke up middle of the night, uh, the other night, and, and we've been kind of going through this transition on what we're doing on our business channel versus what, what our future is going to be, right? We have like these big, these big plans, and that's what kept resonating in my head, is that I don't want to turn around in 50 years in 30 years and say, you know, I, I created a bunch of this, you, you know, just wackadoodle content that served a purpose, but, but didn't really impact lives. And yeah. I, I, this, this, this phrase body of work has been in my, in my mind. And yeah. so 
you start to think about what do you want to be known for, mm -hmm. right? I think that's kind of what you're getting at when you talk about legacy, yeah. right? Is like, 100%. Why, why do people trust and, and, and know you? That's really good. So let's, uh, let me ask you about this. Let me ask you about failure. Um, how do you handle like a massive failure? I mean, something blew up in your face. You thought it was gonna work. You had the balloons ready, the cake was out, and it was like nothing. Uh, it's trying to think about defining failure. You know, I really believe John Maxwell, sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. Right. And that failure is the stepping stones into success. You know, a few years ago, I did a contest to um, uh, Phil Smart Mercedes, Seattle, Washington. Five people got $500 to make a commercial for this car dealership. Yeah. Um, and I really wanted to win, and I put a video together. This could be a little bit of pride, but I truly believe uh, I um, made the best video and I misunderstood the rules, which I asked explicitly about. And my question was, um, how are you gonna vote the winners? And they said, we're going to let people vote online, yeah. plus we're going to uh, vote in the office yeah. uh, and we're gonna aggregate the two. And so I said, okay, great. And so this is, this is kind of an interesting story. I'm in Seattle, at this time I'm working with Benji and Judy yeah. and I, um, and Judy Travis and Veggie Travis are, uh, they have a pretty big vlog influence at the time, like maybe a hundred thousand or 200,000, but that's quite a bit of traffic. Sure. And so they knew that I was doing and whatnot. So I put out my video, the whole office was like, this is the best. I went to like the heart, I was interviewing the founder and I put, and I put this really cool little video together that like ca captured the spirit. And they were just like, they were like, it's our favorite. So like unequivocally, they were like, this, we get that vote. So I was like, okay, I got that vote and I'm in second place on online voting. I think I have this in the bag. You know, I think yeah. I'm gonna win. And, uh, and then there was like this event in Seattle and all these people gathered and all this kind of stuff happens. And then p part of the process was eventually Judy said, hey, do you want me to shout it out on my channel? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I, I, I don't want you to because number one, I'm not worried. This is how the voting process is gonna happen. Right. And number two, um, let's just, you know, I, I kind of want to win this on my own merits. Well, it turns out the person who got first, his, uh, his dad was a radio show host, and that's basically what he got. He got the shout out, and all he got was the votes yeah. online yeah. by actually a very thin margin. And so it's a kind of a funny story, but it, it's one that it stings to this day. Yeah. And even like, I mean, even, even the price, it wasn't, was like, there's, could, there's been, We've had some major fight. I mean, we lost like twenty thousand dollars on our first event. And oh had, wow! You know, I think had, I was there at that first event. You know, <laughs> you know? that was a great event. And you so know, the caviar was a bit much. But. Even the yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> even the actual dollar amounts. I've had bigger losses, but that's that's just like cost of doing business. I know what you mean. Yeah. But it's but it was one of those things, and I mean, it just really it really bummed me out. And uh, and so, anyways, I don't know what the takeaway was. I was. I was bitter about like the, the fact of what the rules were and how it was miscommunicated. And then I brought that up. I said, you said, and they're like, no, that's not what we said. And I was like, all right, well, trust me. I wouldn't have memorized. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I was building towards the rules, <laughs> yeah. you know? I, I mean, I'm like, look, I literally told my famous YouTuber friend not to promote this. Yeah, yeah. And uh, because I thought I just was confident. Anyways, I don't know if that answered your question. It does, and it was right where I was going because I think that we, we always put our best polished versions of ourselves online, and, and I think it's important, especially for new creators, to understand that we go through failure as well and yeah. that we are, we're the same sort of kicking rocks, you know, I, I'll punch walls. I mean, I don't have like a temper temper, but like when I when I'm did sure. something stupid, you know, yeah. like I take time to feel it. I feel like I learn better if I take time to feel it, live in the pain, really understand what went wrong, and then correct it for the yeah. next time. You know, when I was a high school wrestler, sort of, you never let the same guy beat you twice. So, you know, there's a guy across town that wrestles in your weight class. Like, he can beat you once. You don't want it. But if he does beat you once, he can never beat you again, right? Yeah. And so that's the same thing. It's like you can make a mistake once, but you don't want to make that same mistake again. Yep. Uh, let's wind down here. I want to know more about you. I actually get a whole lot of my reading material, my media uh, from the stuff that you post on your stories. Yeah. Uh, so I want to ask you the top five. I want you to answer with um, your favorite right now but also first thing that comes here, like the, the like let's not go too in depth sure. on it, right? So uh, first thing is, what is your favorite song right now? Uh, uh, something by Drake. 
Really? <laughs> yeah. I knew it was going to be, though, hip-hop and R&B. It's going to be yeah, in, yeah, that, yeah. in that category. I'm a big Drake fan uh, and uh, across the board, and so, yeah, uh, I like Drake a lot. Great. What's your favorite TV show right now? Uh, um, favorite TV show right now is Silicon Valley Okay. on HBO. And uh, it's not, uh, yeah, it's, it's really cool because I actually have not been that into Silicon Valley culture yeah. um, as much. You know, people studied like Gates and like Microsoft right. and, and, you know, Apple and the whole thing. But I actually feel like I'm getting smarter. Like I'm learning about like venture That's cool. capital That's cool. and like compression algorithms and all this kind of stuff while being entertained, it's yeah. kind of fun. And there's a lot of stories in the nature of a startup, like how much burn do you have before? Yeah. Like, so, so that's been kind of a fun show and entertaining. Man, the movie thing. Are you disconnected from like Hollywood culture? Like you're just not interested in movies? No, I'm pretty into movies. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I'm kind of, I, I wouldn't even say I'm that into The Rock, but I do love how the legacy is built and whatnot. Dude, Hob I'm Hobbs way into Shaw Dwayne. Was really, yeah, that's good. Hobbs and Shaw was a really good movie, I thought. And, uh, but man, just so much respect for his work ethic, his hustle. And I just learned this, I went to 10X conference. His ex-wife now is his manager. Yes. Right? Yeah. And uh, she was saying this about him and this resonated so much. She said, okay, he's the highest paid actor right now, right? So you could say he's the most successful actor. He's number one. And she said this about him. She said, but he is the most coachable person I've ever met or seen in the world. Wow. And I thought, okay, not only that's probably what has got him here, but even though he's here, that's still how he is. That's right. So he's gonna keep you here. Yeah. He's gonna keep you, yeah. What got you here will keep you here in the sense of being, staying coachable, letting people help him with his lines, yeah. letting people help him get his tri triceps, you know, letting people speak into his life, not thinking he knows it all, but getting coaching co continuously. Yeah. And that's not only how he got to the top, it's how he stays on the that's top. That's great, that's great. I read that post, because you kind of posted uh, after the 10X conference. Yeah. I tagged my whole team and my mentorship group in it, because I thought it was that pivotal. Who's your favorite YouTuber right now? My favorite YouTuber right now, uh, probably most consistently, if I vote with my time, yeah. is Phil DeFranco. Oh my gosh, great content. Yeah, and that's, you know. that's, that's how I get my news. I love the way that he talks with rhythm, because I, I study him a lot, you yeah. know what I mean? I love the way he's just like, welcome to the show, and he's, yeah. he kind of da 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 and it's yeah. very rhythmic, and it's melodic, and when you, you like learn storytelling, that's how they actually want you to be speaking to people in, in a musical way that kind of is very dynamic and brings you low and brings you high and these different things. That's really strong, and I've, I've not only have I studied, I think studying his empire, his business, his sponsorships, his openers, his- Openers are huge. The, the way he's doing things, very dynamic. And so, yeah, not, you, you, I get like two layers of learning. Yeah. What he's actually teaching yeah. on, obviously YouTube news, which is nice, and then, but also general news. Even who he's, you know, like, there's so many nuances that I think, especially yeah. for guys. It's like hard to, yeah, you, any media you watch, you, you know what I mean? You're kind of like looking at the special effects alongside sure. the, the content. Okay, now this is a big one. I know you've got plenty. Name a book that's changed your life. A book that's changed my life. Lately, I've been, um, of course, the Bible, but there's a, uh, what's called a passion translation. Um, it's not a translation. It's really more of a paraphrase, and it gets a lot of flack for the fact yeah. that they use that word very controversial, but I'm like, chill out guys. Look, it's kind of like, it's just, just call it a paraphrase and you're good. Like, and so it's kind of just at a different illumination. Proverbs yeah. in the Passion Translation, man, it, a lot of anything that any guru is teaching, any true success principle can really be rooted back to the Bible. And I think that when you look at ancient wisdom, no matter what your faith background or your belief yeah. is, you can, uh, you can get a lot of timeless truths. And I think that we need those more than ever in the age of, of gimmicks uh, or, or in the age of short-term thinking. Yeah. How can I grow my business in the next six months? How can I grow in the next month? How can I go viral? How can I be famous? How can now, I now, famous? now, now. It's, I think it's the ancient wisdom. And also another book on there would be Business Secrets from the Bible I have that. by Rabbi Daniel Lapin. I have it, yeah. And what a book. Again, same thing, just saying, Financial whatever you believe. right. And even, yeah, just belief about the, the health of a uh, healthy economy. And he's a rabbi. Yeah, he's yeah. a rabbi. So it's not, it's, you know, he's not necessarily a Christian. Right. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that there, uh, I love new tactics, but if we let go of ancient wisdom, we yeah. can get in trouble. And uh, it's about, if it's about legacy, that means it's about the long haul. We don't want to burn out. We don't yeah. want to burn our families out. We don't want to burn ourselves out. We don't want to sacrifice the things that matter most on the altar of success. And so, um, you know, for so many good tactical, like new media marketing and social media books, books like the Bible and books like that are grounded in that ancient wisdom. This is stuff, it's crazy to think that how accurate 
these texts speak to modern culture. Yeah, it's incredible. Written 2,000 plus years ago. Right. And, uh, and how relevant it is that we as humans, not a lot as much as changed is, is thought. It's and very for, true. For yeah. a lot of us that think we're maybe getting so woke, I question, you know, we think we're like learning something now, like it's been there. You're you know? coming back. It's really just lost knowledge that we're re, re, uh, reconnecting with. And you yeah. know, like, I'm so glad that you said that about the passion translation because you do get a lot of flack. Like you don't carry that around with you. Like you open it privately, yeah. but it does make some of that timeless, um, older language, a little bit more accessible exactly. and a little bit more passionate. There's a little bit more of a vibe yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean? so. Yeah, because I mean, when you think about these, uh, the text was written in Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic. And ancient Hebrew, Greek or Aramaic. Yeah, yeah and so, so that's why, just like a paraphrase, it's just kind of a fresh illumination. Yeah. I would not be something that you'd be studying from a scholarly perspe yeah, you're not perspective. Like off of it, you know? But what's cool is it might trigger you to study and go deeper in that passage. Yeah. But in the meantime, uh, there's a lot in there that I think can equip business leaders and entrepreneurs yeah. to uh, really have an edge. That's great. So check out the book of Proverbs. Sean, thank you for spending time with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time on the Owen Video Channel.